Yeah, my name is Patrick Stangby. I'm 32 years old. I work with uh, creative direction and strategy. So I've been doing that uh, since I finished my studies in different capacities. Yeah, I did my first running race actually when I was 26. And I did a few runs prior to that with my mother in my childhood, but it was very casual and on our local trails. So, and I think we just did it a few times and it was like a 2K or a four kilometer. So very filled with joy or nothing competitive. But when I was 26, I had a friend of mine who had signed up for a marathon. And I think I was always interested in running as a sport. I was watching some marathons on TV or some half marathons. And I did uh, jog a bit, which I still like to make this distinction between jogging and running. So I was it wasn't that I was never participating in running or going for a run, but I was not considering myself a runner. And then I signed up for a marathon because he did. And I thought that if he could do it, I should do it as well. So it was maybe yeah, something of a bit competitive spirit between two friends, but also something to do together. And uh, we trained and practiced a bit together. At the moment, we were also living together. So it was a nice thing to do with uh, your friend and for the friendship. And at my first race, I didn't really think I was going to be competitive. I mean, I was not a good runner at the time. I'm not even sure always if I am right now. But um, I, at the starting line, when I saw all the other people, I was feeling this like idea that I wanted to compete. I was going to have fun and enjoy but I also wanted to compete with the other people. And I didn't have any expectations to myself. And I finished in three hours and 19 minutes, I think, which is uh, acceptable for someone who doesn't have a running background. And I was very happy with myself. And at that moment in my life, I mean, I had finished my education. I had done, done things I should be proud of. But it was probably one of the moments that filled me with most gratitude and joy. So, and after I was very destroyed for a month or so, so I didn't want to run or do anything. But then slowly I thought like, what is the next one? And I didn't think there would be a next one. So that's when I started running or how I got into running. But then immediately after I got mostly into what we consider trail running or yeah, if we make a separation. I mean, I, th I think I if we make it very easy, then it's also maybe not as personal. But I think today, and especially we talked about gender in this sport, about equality in this sport earlier today with some friends. And it's still very dominated by uh, like a middle-aged white male. And that's maybe because that person has both the time, the money and the freedom to do it. But also society created structures that uh, this man feel very comfortable in every environment. So for me, probably what I then, uh, I mean, we run from is the fact that for that type of person, which also I maybe identify as, I mean, my life was in the end pretty easy. I mean, I had a very normal upbringing, so say middle class upbringing, but I come from a country which was mostly safe and people had good opportunity. So I think we, I run from the fact that life is sometimes a bit too easy. And we need this challenge and always as uh, men, but also today women, we created some challenges when we had uh, comfort in our lives. And maybe I at some point found too much comfort in my life that life was a bit easy. So I may be running away from this comfort. I want the challenge of something to uh, discover myself or to explore other sides of myself through this discomfort because as we saw this weekend here and uh, through the week actually and in this sport, it's a lot of discomfort. Yeah, I mean, for me, probably in a race, I don't think so much about other things in my life or things outside. Yeah. Uh, I'm focused, but also I'm not s super focused. You try to let time pass. And r through now, I think I've been running these kind of races for six years. And what probably changed in the, I'm not sure, the past four years or three years, is that sometimes it seems that time is just passing by. I mean, the first time I did an 80 kilometer, for example, I don't remember the time I spent, but say I spent 10 hours or 11 hours. I think the time went very slow. Like I look at my watch and there's like two hours or three hours and it seems like it takes forever. Uh, but at this point, sometimes I can look and it's just already four hours has passed. 
So I think I became very comfortable mentally with just being outside and moving. Uh, but in my training, I have a lot of good ideas for work or for my life. It's a time and moment where I don't look at my phone. I can process things. So I use it also as a mental tool. For me, it's not only about becoming more fit or the physical aspect, uh, but probably it's also a separation between the training and the competitive part. Yeah. Oh yeah, f uh, coming from a country with a different climate all the time, I think we are at least very concerned in Norway with wearing wool. And uh, many people think that wool is only for heavy winter, but for example, merino wool can be great. Um, I like it close to my body. And for example, in a race like this, if you would run through the night or in just in the evening, we see a lot of people, for example, they wear wool sleeves. So they might wear a t-shirt, but they can have sleeves on and they pull them on and up according to how they feel, if they're going uphill or downhill, if they're cold or warm. Uh, but also actually in terms of sometimes just your wrist, you, especially also if you want to regulate if you're very warm, you can add water just to your wrist because it's where you take your pulse. So you can regulate heat very easily, but also when it's cold, like maybe that's the first place you add some wool or something. And for me also the same goes for gloves. So I always bring some very light merino wool gloves. So maybe it looks strange to some, but many times before I would put on a jacket, I would put on gloves because sometimes I might not fully need a jacket, but I can easily access my gloves if I'm feeling a bit cold. And for me, that helps me feel safe in the mountains if it's, yeah, the weather is uh, bad or if we're going through the evening or yeah, having different situations. I think it's a mix. I mean, I really appreciate synthetics um, for a lot of things, but I think we have natural materials that work very well. But usually there's also a combination in between the two because 100% pure merino is in the end not so long lasting. So even talking about uh, sustainability, if you add some nylon, normally the merino is stronger and you have it for a lot longer. So the longevity is much better. So for me, I think there is a certain mix between the two. And especially today still for outerwear and other things, you might need to have uh, synthetics to have the correct performance. But now we also have a modern biodegradable synthetics. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. No, but I, to be fair, I think a lot of ideas have been explored and there's a lot of gear that exists. Uh, but I think also as we start to have new materials developing, uh, people will find ways to use those materials also for running. So I have some things in mind and uh, hopefully we'll see them at some point. Okay. So I bet I shouldn't share with everyone. But I think it's also good today that if people have ideas that uh, there exist some uh, websites where you can buy some fabrics or some stuff. So people can explore themselves and figure out you, it doesn't need to arrive from a brand necessarily. Um, for me, it really depends when it comes to footwear. Um, I think until actually I ran in uh, Norda, which I started doing last July. So I think I was maybe running in an early shoe before they release. Uh, I was very into like, I like cushioning, but I wouldn't sacrifice cushioning for stability. So I really care a lot about the stability of the shoe. That's probably my main concern. And if I can have good stability, I am happy to have good cushioning. But previously, I would, was willing to sacrifice some cushioning for stability. Uh, yeah, I tried some. I'm not really sure if it works with carbon plate in a shoe, but uh, I am. I mean, it's difficult to understand at this point. But um, yeah, of course, it's a welcome technology if it works. Uh, but I struggle a bit. Mm, from my perspective to understand how it's working unless the race is not very technical. Yeah. No, I mean, I think uh, the race I was uh, racing this weekend was 101 kilometer uh, with 6,000 meters of uh, elevation. So in order to prepare for this race, I think you need to run uh, for several years, first uh, of all, because uh, your muscles need to be adapted to taking the downhill especially. And then through the season, you need to have both some 
train some speed if you want to go not so slow. I mean, so I think for the preparations, you need to start quite early. So most people, they get to understand that they're going into this race since the end of January. And hopefully at this point, they are already training and they're not out of shape or not training. And then it's about maybe understanding that depending on how you l where you live, that you need to run an up uphill and downhill so your legs can take this kind of race. Because a lot of races are 100k, but not in these mountains. I mean, we are sitting now on the, uh, yeah, just like in Chamonix next to Mont Blanc. And it's the tallest mountain in Europe. So we need to understand that uh, in order to get around, it's, um, yeah, I needed also a lot of work in uphill and downhill training. And that differs for a lot of people. So for me, I need to spend some of my vacations or some weekends to go places where I can train. So that's a lot of my preparation. And then there is preparation in terms of uh, yeah, food and drink and other things. Uh, but I think this is easier and easier as you run ultras through several years. So in the beginning, you stress more about these things. But um, now it's... I know what to do when it comes to the nutrition most of the time and sometimes we also struggle with the stomach or things happen but um, yeah you have a plan at least so my plan was that uh, I raced this race before first of all so I was familiar with the course and also expectations about how to feel at certain moments and times um, so my plan was that um, I was going to plan to start a bit slower than I did in 2019 because I felt uh, I had some issues after 55, 60 kilometers then, but more like cramping. And probably at that point I had only ran three years as well. So my legs were not strong enough. I mean, I was pretty fast for my level. Uh, but I didn't have the right muscles to actually probably do very well in the race. Uh, so now I felt much m better prepared. S but I was also still planning to go a bit slower until the halfway point at Champelac at 55 kilometers and then speed up. Because I saw many results from other people, which I had checked that I had a goal time I wanted to arrive in, which was around 12 hours and 30 minutes. And I saw the people who arrive in 12 hours and 30 minutes and seem to have a b good day. They were running not too fast until Champelac and then speeding up. And you saw some people who also arrive in 12 uh, hours and 30 minutes, but they were slowing down a lot after Champelac. And I assume that the experience of the people who could still go a bit faster rather than slower had a better, like they were splitting their day in a better way or managing their energy in a better way. So this was my plan and so I started not so hard so for me it was quite comfortable in the beginning because I could have run much harder uh, but uh, I didn't I felt I shouldn't or didn't have to so that was good but um, in the second climb up to Grand Col Ferre which is the highest point of my route in CCC uh, I started to feel like a headache and I, I was not thinking too much about it, but I was also a bit scared that I had some issues before with the altitude. And uh, since I live at sea level and train at sea level, it can happen. But for some people, it also never happens. So I was thinking, okay, maybe it's just like a short moment in time. I'm not having a good uh, moment. So let's see if it passes. And then I reached the top of uh, Grand Col Ferre and I started to go down. And I felt so much better. And then I realized immediately that it's the altitude that is having this trouble for me. So I, I got a bit concerned, but I was also feeling so much better that I was running down the valley and having a good time. So I was like thinking that it might be better. But I was also concerned that the next climb I was going to do, if I started feeling bad in the same way, that I m might not be able or shouldn't finish the race. Because uh, for me, it's not something to... I mean, we push our body, but there are some health aspects I think also we should be careful of. So, and for me, the altitude is something I don't understand how it affects me. So I didn't want to push through it. Uh, and then I start to feel this sensation again once I go up to the halfway point. And I thought like, okay, this is not actually good. I'm considering what to do. 
and I knew that I had three quite high climbs to finish after this and even my if my legs were great I didn't think it was a good idea to do it if I had this sensation from the altitude and the it's like you can consider it's a really bad headache but you also get dizzy and some other problems from it so um, I decided to stop at the 55 kilometer which is of course the first of all it you are sad because you had a lot of present uh, like preparations and when you're a runner these races are very important most likely because of the event and the spectacle and everything but you consider this race more important than the other races you have in a year so if it's one race you don't want to drop it's this one but then it's if it also ends up being the one you drop you feel immediately quite sad because you know that you might not be able to enter next year and then you don't know how long it's going to be until the next time you have a chance uh, so it's more about that but uh, in the end i felt i was comfortable with my choice um, but of course you start to think immediately about the next opportunity <laughs> yeah. and I think that says something also about the mentality of um, the runner because you're always looking for when could I try again and have a better day yeah, yeah let's see I mean now these races are quite hard to enter yeah. so I need to find a way this fall but I mean already today I tried to find a way to find a way back you know so be previously there was a ranking system and a system of lottery but now the ranking system doesn't apply yet so I'm not safe from entering that way um, <coughs> but now there is a series of races which are run or in the UTMB series so I already found a race in Sweden uh, in November and if I can finish top three in one of those two distances I can immediately qualify but anyways if i finish them i will have these uh, running stones that they call them now so i can enter the lottery uh, but at least that's on my agenda already so normally it would take maybe a few days after a race before you want to consider a new one uh, but i already checked today to find a way to <laughs> be back so but for me if i come back next year i'm probably doing utmb I have a two strange experience in very long ultras and both were in Norway and but for me the experience which is probably the more crazy to use that word is the uh, one in Lofoten which is in the north of Norway and it happens on the last weekend of uh, May so but crossing over to June and the weather can still be quite uh, bad in this moment but you can also have beautiful weather and I was racing a um, race there in 2019 that was 100 miles that uh, had the, the most crazy weather I ever witnessed in a race. So it was uh, plus degrees Celsius, but barely, and it was raining and uh, 20 meter a second winds. So it felt like it was freezing and it would probably have been better if it was snowing in terms of how it felt but it was just above to actually be snowing and that race I started out like looking at the um, say the course record and the time but in the end it just ended up being a race about uh, surviving which in the end was quite I mean it was scary at some moment but it was also fun that you you forgot about the competitiveness and the racing you just try to get from one point to the other one and it's more like an um, expedition or a journey. So for me, that was quite interesting as well. And but definitely the most uh, challenging because of all the circumstances. Uh, and in this moment, you had to, of course, take care of your body and your running like you would in a normal race. But then you had all these other elements on top as well yeah i'm not really sure i mean i thought about my running goals a few times and uh, for me i want to stay in the sport for a long time because i really enjoy the race and as we said also the mental aspect of probably the training uh, and there's some races of course which i would dream about doing or hope to be doing and i mean we are sitting here now and utmb is of course one of them so but i don't have a goal in terms of time or positioning or to make it a career or not a career 
Um, but probably coming back to the marathon, there are also times in the marathon which I would like to do, but I'm confident that I will do them at some point. And they are also not the top priority for me, at least at in this moment. Yeah, I, I think we always had this discussion about a favorite trail also with some of my friends. And I, first of all, it's a bit maybe cliche to say, but it's also encouraging to people. But I think for me, the favorite trail is also the trail that you have or the one you have available to you. Because especially as a tool in your everyday, it's like, of course, we can all dream about going here to Chamonix and run these trails. Uh, but if you have some trails close to where you are, uh, they can give you so much joy and pleasure in your everyday life as well. And for most people, we have more everyday situations than we have vacations or weekends or other things in our life. And I never also experienced the same trail exactly in the same way. Because uh, you have different weather, different conditions. You are maybe alone, you are with different people. Uh, the seasons change. So even me, I mean, I have uh, one trail, which I normally do once every week. And then I try to mix other stuff. But even that trail now, after, say, six years of running it almost every week, uh, I'm still not bored by this route. And it's just 11 kilometers. So you could imagine after a while that you would like, I don't want to see this trail again in my life. Uh, but it completely changes, so I would say. But of course, there are also more spectacular places to run and to see. But I think they exist everywhere. I mean, we're looking around us now, and now it's dark, but <laughs> we probably have like 20 trails, which are completely beautiful. Uh, but also, if we go to the next valley, we will have something similar. So I think trail running is a good opportunity to explore trails everywhere. And of course, you might find some favorites. But for me, I'm just um, yeah happy to run any trail if I have to. <laughs> Hmm, lo I'm not really sure how we ended up here this year, but uh, of course now we are sitting here in uh, a house with uh, people from Norda and friends of Norda, and I'm here with them as well since I'm running in the shoes since a bit more than a year, and I'm happy to be here with them. Uh, but uh, I had a normal qualification process to get there this year, and um, yeah, I it was like the normal way of entering at least uh, technically the race. Uh, but I also ended up here, I think, because I really wanted to be back. So it was also my desire to be here this year and I wanted to be here. Uh, but sin or besides the years during the pandemic, uh, I was here since I was helping crewing a friend in 2018 and then I ran in 2019. So for me, it's also maybe it feels natural to me that this is where I want to be the last week of August and probably for some years to come. I don't think this sensation will change because for me it's beautiful. Uh, sometimes this sport can be very, l not lonely, but it's like about s being alone in the forest or maybe you have some friends or community. But this is like a festival in the end. It's full of people and some for some people it's way too many, but it's not normal and it's one week in a year. So I think you can also enjoy that it's a show, right? I think it's one of the difficult questions, but uh, as we said before, I probably run for the same reasons that what I'm running away from. So maybe I run f for some, I mean, expedition feeling or some journey or something that transports me, uh, both physically, of course, because you're moving, but also intellectually or mentally. Uh, that I run for this fact that like uh, we can push ourselves as human beings, we can move forward, we can progress and we can also better ourselves. And it's a very like easy way to understand how you can better yourself. Uh, and I also believe that I'm a better human being when I'm running than when I'm not running. And hopefully most people around me agree, but if they <laughs> don't, then it's uh, also on them. So that's probably what I run for. But I also run for pleasure and it's for joy. I mean, for me, running, of course, and also ultra, it's filled with all emotions that your life encompass. So you have everything. Uh, so probably I, r I run for everything, basically. <laughs> but uh, yeah, mostly for this idea that we can progress and we can better ourselves and 
you see so many people are proud to finish something and even if they do it mostly for themselves you also see their friends and their families touched or they feel something so it's also the ceremonial aspect probably in life i mean um, we have institutions and religions and other things that also refers to some ceremony uh, but for me also running has this element of uh, ceremony